of the sanctity of human life and allows individual states to make choices regarding the unborn in those states. It it doesn't surprise me at all that there are protests objecting to that. Evil very seldom relinquishes the stage. We have to overcome evil with good. So it requires us to find our voices. I hope you're doing that around your kitchen table, in your neighborhoods, at the ball fields when you're waiting for your children, at work, wherever it is the Lord has given you influence or an opportunity to interact with people. I hope you're helping identify the things you see God doing. I hope you're talking about them and encouraging other people to see them. In this session, I want to focus on one specific aspect of how we thrive in this big trouble. And it it has to do with the foundations of our lives. When there is tremendous stress, the ultimate determination, if the structure, the event, the business, the relationship, whatever it is, will survive, has everything to do with the foundation. If you're doing the Bible reading with us, our, our reading today seemed appropriate. How many of you are doing the daily Bible reading? Good for you. What do the rest of you do? It will help you. It really will. 15, 20 minutes a day, you can read through your Bible in a year. The discipline of it will change your life. I can testify to that. It is changing my life. But our reading today, the first four verses said, when you go to war against your enemies and you see horses and chariots and an army greater than yours, when the enemy is stronger than you, do not be afraid of them because the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt will be with you. When the enemy's stronger than you are, don't be afraid of them. Do you ever feel inadequate? A little too insignificant? Your voice is too small? Your resources aren't great enough? Nobody cares that much about my opinion? The knuckleheads have bigger microphones? It's not a new thing. This goes all the way back to the book of Deuteronomy, and God is addressing it. When you're about to go into battle, the priest shall come forward and address the army. The priest! He shall say, hear, O Israel, today you're going into battle against your enemies. Do not be faint-hearted or afraid. If God's telling you not to be faint-hearted or afraid, guess what? Your heart is thumping and you're terrified. Do not be terrified or give way to panic before them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. The victory doesn't come from the army. The victory doesn't come from your strategy. God may give you an effective army and an effective strategy, but the victory comes from the Lord. We've been saying this for months and months now. The problems we face are not political or ideological. They're not about a political party or economic decisions or international circumstances. The problems we face fundamentally are spiritual. And until we have a different spiritual response, we're not going to have a different outcome physically. God is training his people in the book of Deuteronomy how to lead triumphant lives. And he said, when there's a physical enemy, when there's an army that can overpower you, don't be afraid of them. That's counterintuitive. In fact, he said, when you find that circumstance, call the priest to talk to the troops. I'm looking forward to that day when we bring prayer back forward in our nation. When we bring it back into our hospital corridors without anxiety or back into our courtrooms and our classrooms, back into the military. It's time. I hear people who spent their career in the military saying that they don't have the freedom any longer to encourage a, somebody that's serving with them to read their Bible or to pray in Jesus' name. It's almost unthinkable to me that we sit silently by how, why that happens. What have we been doing? Lord, I'm sorry. I hope you are. This isn't somebody else's problem, folks. On our watch, we've been quiet for too long. They've told us not to bring our faith to corporate America. While well, corporate America takes, takes their worldview and imposes upon the rest of us. I, I'm not angry at them. I'm embarrassed for my cooperation with the intimidation tactics of the last few decades. But we're changing. We're beginning to pray. We're beginning to put our trust in the Lord in some new ways.
We're walking through a season where our reality isn't easy to establish. We're not sure which messages to trust or which messengers are really trustworthy. Fear has been unleashed as a tool to manipulate enormous blocks of people. And our opponent are not people or institutions or organizations or expressions of government. The, the wrestling match is with spiritual forces of darkness in this world. If you haven't realized it yet, I assure you there's a battle underway for the heart and soul of America. And again, the question, what should we do? How do we respond? I'm just an individual. Nobody knows my name or pays attention to me. I don't have access to great power or resources. What should we do? I began writing Big Trouble Ahead when we first heard about COVID-19. There was this frightening virus coming our way from Wuhan with predictions that millions of people were going to die. Well, I opened my Bible. I began to say, God, what are you doing? And what became so clear to me is that there was big trouble ahead. It's a biblical word. The biblical word's tribulation. And there's multiple warnings that between here and the end of the age, there's going to be some big trouble. We shouldn't be frightened or caught off guard. What I didn't know when I began writing was how quickly it would come or the depths to which we would descend. This week, the World Health Organization said that gender's not binary. They could read their Bible and save them some trouble. God hasn't changed his mind. In our own nation, the violence, the lawlessness, the disregard for boundaries that have been established for generations, the economic uncertainty, it grows week over week. Here's the good news. God has given us a real plan for flourishing in the midst of the trouble. We don't have to be frightened or threatened or intimidated. God's got this, and so do we. As reeling events continue to unfold in our nation and world, the news headlines will have to be deciphered through the lens of a biblical perspective. And Pastor Allen has an urgent message of hope in his new book, Big Trouble Ahead. We can take hold of a real plan to stabilize us through the shaking and even flourish in the midst of it. Big Trouble Ahead lays out the fundamental truths and instructive foresight found within the Bible to help prepare us to overcome as the birth pains continue. And it explains how to counter the barrage of deception that's trying to rob us of our courage and stability. Get Big Trouble Ahead when donating $25 or more today at allenjackson.com or by calling 1-800-880-5102. So what is our response to the big trouble? Hebrews 12 and verse 2. We looked at this verse on Sunday. We'll, we'll, we'll take off from here. It says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is our model. What do we do in the face of trouble? It says, fix your attention on Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. He had to go through something. He couldn't fulfill God's purposes for his life without having to overcome something. And neither will you or I. This notion that the point of our faith is just to make our lives easy and every moment fun is deception. Now, you don't have to go looking for trouble. Life will bring enough to you. But the coaching we're given is to fix our attention on Jesus. He's the author and the completer of our faith. Consider him, in verse 3, who endured such opposition from sinful men. He endured opposition because there were people who rejected God. In every generation from 1797 to the first century to the 21st century, there are men and women who will not cooperate with God. But they're not passive in that rebellion. They oppose those who choose to cooperate with God. They crucified Jesus. They opposed Wilberforce, and they will oppose the purposes of God in the 21st century. Okay, duly noted. Let's go anyway. Amen. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So what's the warning? Don't get tired. And when you get tired, don't lose heart. You ever get tired? 
Yeah, look at the person next to you. Say, you look like somebody that gets tired. We all do. We all have those days. It usually starts with a thought or an idea, or maybe it gets salted with a feeling. I just, and I don't want to do that today. I don't want to read my Bible. I don't want to be kind. I don't want to be upright. I mean, I, we laugh about it. You know, you go to the grocery, you're in the express line. Eight items or less. And the person in front of you has got 40. You know, on some days I'm feeling compassionate. I'll help them bag their groceries. Most days, I want to take the celery stalk and thump them over the head. Let me help you count to eight. One, two. Right? But usually, those aren't my real challenges. I can find enough patience to get through the grocery store. It's the days when you think, you know, I don't, I don't want to do this. I'm tired. I'm, it's not working out right. I'm afraid. The, the change is too much. There's, I mean, it, it's a, you have to guard your heart. Everybody does. The delivery of those ideas and those emotions is universal. It comes to all of us. It's why the counsel of Hebrews is to not grow weary and to lose heart. So what do we do with that? Let's, let's take it a step further. Jesus gave us some instructions in Matthew 7. It's a familiar parable. You, you will know it. I didn't even put the whole parable in your notes. He said, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. That's the category. The people who hear his words and put them into practice. You need both parts of the equation. You can, you can know all about what Jesus said, but choose not to practice it. But those who hear the words and put them into practice is a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house, but it didn't fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Now, you know the alternative. Somebody built their foundation on the sand. Same beautiful house, same construction company, just two different foundations. And Jesus said the outcome isn't the storms. The storms are the same. Life's challenges come to everybody, unexpected disappointments, intrusions, unfair, illegitimate expressions of evil that touch our lives. But he said, you can build your life in such a way that when the storm comes, it doesn't collapse. I'm interested in that. Are you interested in that? How do we establish our lives that way? Well, the author of Hebrews says we have to fix our attention on Jesus. Jesus said we need to hear his words and determine to put them into practice. So I think it's safe to say from that that foundations are essential. I know it's true with the building. I've been involved in quite a bit of construction, and I know that those foundations have a lot of specific engineering directed towards them. The more sophisticated the building, the more so the sophisticated the foundations, they're important because the, whatever structure comes above it will never be any better than the foundation. I had a friend one time lived in Florida and he, he was showing me some construction projects and there was a, a multi-story apartment building that was leaning. It was going to have to be completely demolished. They didn't get the foundation right. Whoops. Well, we've seen that in our spiritual lives. Some of us had to have had to tear some things down and rebuild on a better foundation. It's a part of how we learn. So foundations are essential. Look at Psalm 11 and verse 3. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? That's a very important question. Because there are times in history, times in the unfolding narrative of civilizations and the people of God, when there is an, an intentional attempt to disrupt foundations. We're watching one of those times. They say they're going to redefine marriage. Well, God hasn't changed his imagination of marriage. They're going to redefine family. Well, God hasn't changed the definition. In spite of our, the brokenness of our marriages and the brokenness of our families, God's imagination of that has never changed. It is pr proven over millennia to be the most stable, fruitful ways for human beings to live together. We're living in a time where evil is celebrated and good is condemned. Things like purity and integrity and honesty are openly chided. And we will celebrate people who are manipulative 
dishonest, immoral. Does that sound like the world you're watching? Recognize it for what it is. It's an attack on the foundations. We cannot continue to do that and imagine we will flourish as a people. Now, I'm not talking about your faith, but I'm telling you as a society, if we want our children and our grandchildren to live in a stable place with opportunity and freedoms and liberties, we're going to have to have the courage to stand for those foundational ideas and values. Things like truth should be expected. We shouldn't be tolerant of deception and misleading statements and misremembering. We all make mistakes, but there's a difference in making a mistake and being intentionally deceptive. But don't look outside. It's an honor to be with you again. We're continuing our study on how to flourish in the midst of this season of trouble. Maybe even the preliminary of the big trouble, that tribulation that the Bible talks to us about. There's some specific skills that make a difference. The beginning of the narrative is the person of Jesus. For too long, I think we have made other things primary. The congregation where we worship, the denomination to which we belong, the translation of the Bible we prefer to read, the style of worship that we're most comfortable with. All of those things are okay. They're not wicked or evil or wrong, but they're not primary. Our story begins with the person of Jesus, and the outcome of our lives is totally dependent upon him. So all of those other things have to be subjugated to Jesus. We're going to look at that from a biblical vantage point to see if we can understand how to give greater honor to Jesus in our daily lives. It'll change everything. Grab your Bible and a notepad, but most of all, open your heart to God's invitations today. Let's talk about that foundation in a little more detail because it's personal. It isn't about a congregation or a denomination or a theology or a translation of the Bible. Ultimately, the foundation of your life, the foundation of your faith is a person. And the more clarity you have around that and the more real, the more personally that's established within us, the more stable our lives become no matter the storms around us. Look in 1 Corinthians 3. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. Paul's writing to the church in Corinth that he helped call into existence. But he said, but each one should be careful how he builds, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid which is Jesus, the Messiah. Paul said there's only one foundation for God's people, and that's Jesus as the Messiah. So if we imagine that we're, our, our first identi- identity is a Christ follower, is a denomination, a style of worship, a day when we meet, a time of day when we meet, the, the, the attire that we wear when we gather, whatever it may be, then we're building on the wrong foundation. If we imagine we've earned it, we deserve it. It's about our intellect or our moral code. The foundation of our faith is a person and his name is Jesus. You have no standing with God apart from the person of Jesus. Apart from Jesus, we stand in our guilt. We stand in our sin. We stand in our inadequacy. We stand in our shortcomings. In Christ, we are the righteousness of God. In him, we have been justified. In him, through his blood, we have been sanctified. Our faith is anchored in the person of Jesus. Am I surprised when people are offended that we say Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by him? No, it doesn't surprise me at all. If I were in charge of evil, I would oppose that too. Now, it concerns me when in the church... We whisper it because we don't want to say it very loudly. What else do we have to trust in? What else do you think can secure your future in this present season? Look at Isaiah 20, 28. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I lay a stone in Zion, 
a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who trusts will never be dismayed. Jesus is the stabilizing component of our lives. Nations change, empires come and go. This empire that has defined our existence up until now, it may very well be passing away. Folks, that's a part of history. I would regret it if we forfeited our liberties and freedoms because of our selfishness and our rebellion against God. But he won't change my faith. If we don't have the courage to stand up and say we've been blessed by God and to defend that story, we don't deserve it. We're going to have to have the boldness to stand up in the face of the people who are working busily to destroy the foundations, the foundational principles and values that have enabled the blessings of God to come to us. We're going to have to have the willingness to say, I disagree. I appreciate your right to that opinion, but I don't agree with it. And I won't be silent while you shout it. Look at Ephesians 2. Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people because you joined World Outreach. Oh, I'm sorry, it doesn't really say that, does it? You're members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and Southern culture. Well, it doesn't say that either. On the foundation of apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. We're coming right back to what Jesus said to us. The one of us who hears my words and puts them into practice, it became the message of the church as it spread around the Roman world. They said it's no longer about Jew or Gentile, male or female, slave nor free. All the things that we've used to identify ourselves or to separate ourselves. They said the chief cornerstone is nothing other than the person of Jesus of Nazareth. That's our message. First Peter chapter 2. I love this. This is the fisherman. He's nearing the end of his life. He's a young man. He's recruited. When Jesus meets him, he's, his skin is tanned by the sun and his arms are corded with the muscle from pulling in the fishing nets. And now at the end of his life, he has spent himself in service of this most remarkable man he met. And he said, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. Are you willing to stand next to Jesus when he's rejected by men? We got to find a new gear, folks. We've wanted to be in the sweet spot of public affirmation. Yes. And we're going to have to say, I want to stand next to Jesus. He's been rejected by many powerful places. But he's the cornerstone of my life. He's the foundation of my hope. He secures my future. He's the best friend I have. Wouldn't you like to know him? And the minutes I have left, I want to take this foundational idea. It is a person. But we know that person, the language we use for coming to know Jesus, for yielding to him, to giving him first priority, describes our transference from the kingdom of darkness into his kingdom of light. We call it many things. We call it conversion, salvation, the new birth. We have oversimplified it. We, we, we've tried to microwave it into its minimal essence and then move past it. In the book of Romans, it said it occurs that that new birth occurs when we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. But the larger message of the New Testament says we have to grow up in our faith. And it challenges us. It says at the point when you, you should be ready for something other than the food for babies, you still need milk. You need to grow up, it says. I believe God is saying to the church in our nation, it's time to grow up. We, we've grown fat and sloppy off of his blessings and his mercy and his grace. If we're going to see those extended to our children and grandchildren, we're going to have to grow up.
We're walking through a season where our reality isn't easy to establish. We're not sure which messages to trust or which messengers are really trustworthy. Fear has been unleashed as a tool to manipulate enormous blocks of people. And our opponent are not people or institutions or organizations or expressions of government. The, the wrestling match is with spiritual forces of darkness in this world. If you haven't realized it yet, I assure you there's a battle underway for the heart and soul of America. And again, the question, what should we do? How do we respond? I'm just an individual. Nobody knows my name or pays attention to me. I don't have access to great power or resources. What should we do? Now, I began writing Big Trouble Ahead when we first heard about COVID-19. There was this frightening virus coming our way from Wuhan with predictions that millions of people were going to die. Well, I opened my Bible. I began to say, God, what are you doing? And what became so clear to me is that there was big trouble in it. It's a biblical word. The biblical word's tribulation. And there's multiple warnings that between here and the end of the age, there's going to be some big trouble. We shouldn't be frightened or caught off guard. What I didn't know when I began writing was how quickly it would come or the depths to which we would descend. This week, the World Health Organization said that gender's not binary. They could read their Bible and save them some trouble. God hasn't changed his mind. In our own nation, the violence, the lawlessness, the disregard for boundaries that have been established for generations, the economic uncertainty, it grows week over week. Here's the good news. God has given us a real plan for flourishing in the midst of the trouble. We don't have to be frightened or threatened or intimidated. God's got this, and so do we. As reeling events continue to unfold in our nation and world, the news headlines will have to be deciphered through the lens of a biblical perspective. And Pastor Allen has an urgent message of hope in his new book, Big Trouble Ahead. We can take hold of a real plan to stabilize us through the shaking and even flourish in the midst of it. Big Trouble Ahead lays out the fundamental truths and instructive foresight found within the Bible to help prepare us to overcome as the birth pains continue. And it explains how to counter the barrage of deception that's trying to rob us of our courage and stability. Get Big Trouble Ahead when donating $25 or more today at allenjackson.com or by calling 1-800-880-5102. So here's the idea. I would submit to you that that conversion experience, salvation, the new birth, has got to reach your will. It has to take enough root in our hearts that we say, my choice is to honor the Lord. I choose to honor the Lord. I'm determined to honor the Lord. I am practicing the discipline to honor the Lord. We'll stop with the sloppiness and the excuses. We'll stop pointing at some past experience and say, oh, I, I did my God business. That's his, that is misplaced. I've told you many things. It's as misplaced as me showing you a picture of my 16-year-old self. It's like, I don't really need a physical. Look at me. I'm healthy. And we like to tell our faith story in terms of when we entered the kingdom of God. The, the, the question is, how is our health today? I want to give you an example. It's Acts chapter 5. It's a familiar story. It's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. The church is still a very fledgling thing in Jerusalem. It's a story of exemplary judgment. God is establishing an example. I'll give you the punchline because many of you know the story. I don't believe the punchline is that everybody who lies at church dies. Or we would have to gather in the parking lot. We all understand that. But it is a story saying very, very clearly that God said the purity of my house, the purity of my people matters. Your faith has to reach to your will. Listen to the way it's told. This is Acts 5, a man named Ananias. Who, who's, who's the author of the book of Acts? Luke. The gospel in the book of Acts. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property with his wife's full knowledge. 
Watch the emphasis through here. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself. And he brought the rest and he put it at the apostles' feet. They're going to make a generous gift to the church. They've sold some assets and they're going to make a gift to the church. But they're misrepresenting it. They want, to, they want the affirmation that comes from a sacrificial gift that they're not making. They want to describe their gift in sacrificial terms that are not accurate. Gives me pause in how I describe what I give. And Peter said to him, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? Wow. Maybe, I just, maybe he's bad at math. No, it says he and his wife worked out this scheme. And you've kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. Listen to what Peter says. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it sold, was it the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You didn't lie to men. You lied to God. Did you hear him? He said, look, it was your land. It was your money. You could have kept it all. You could have kept some part of it. But you decided to lie to God about it. See, our conversion, our life transformation has to reach all the way to our will. Our intent has to be to honor the Lord. Now, we grow up into that. We don't start there. That's not fully formed. When you're young and immature, I didn't need to have an intent to be healthy. Our youth is wasted on us. I thought my physical health was just something to be consumed. I bounced when I fell. If something broke, it healed almost overnight. You were like a superhero. That changes a little bit. You have to grow up with a different awareness. We have to grow up in our faith. And just in case we didn't miss it in episode one, they record the second half of the story for us. Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. Great fear seized all who heard what. No kidding, don't you know everybody else in the offering line was checking their numbers? (laughs) The young men came, wrapped up his body, they carried him out. Three hours later, his wife came in. You see, you could have told this narrative without that. It's an intentional focus on something. Three hours later, here comes his wife, not knowing what had happened. Peter said, tell me. Is this the purchase price of the property? He doesn't wait for her to step in the hole. He just asks her. Yes, that's the price. How could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door. They'll carry you out also. And it's important enough in the emerging story of the church that Luke writes it down and says, don't anybody miss this. Please don't miss this. Is it safe to say that American Christendom has been pretty sloppy? We've been a little casual? Maybe just a touch. Oh, I go to church. Oh, well. That's the ticket. I'll give you one more passage. Matthew 13. These are Jesus' words. It's a parable he taught. It's the parable of the farmer that went out to sow the seed. Remember the parable? There's four separate landing places for the seed, four separate outcomes. The disciples didn't understand the parable, so in private they ask for an interpretation, and Jesus gives it to them. It's in your notes. It's Matthew 13. Listen to what the parable of the sower means. Anyone who hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. It's consistent with what we've said so far. Jesus said the strongest foundation is the one who hears the word and puts it into practice. So the first casualty group here, he said, is someone who hears the word, but the enemy snatches it out of your heart. There's no implementation. How does he do that? Lots of ways. If somebody just cuts you off in the parking lot, you can lose emotional control and whatever benefit you gained in the house, you'll lose it before you get off campus. The evil one comes and snatches away. This is the seed that was sown along the path. Verse 20, the one who has received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. 
but he has no root. He lasts only a short time when trouble or persecution comes because of the word. Not trouble or persecution because of wickedness or ungodliness or immorality. But you hear the word of God and there's pushback. Somebody says to you, do you really believe that? Or I think Christians are hypocrites. Or let me tell you what I know about those people you go to church with. Or have you heard? When there is some pushback on the word of God you heard. Have you ever experienced that? I have experienced that. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. So here's the category where you've received it with joy, but you didn't have much depth. You didn't have a system of people around you to encourage you, to affirm it, to help you stabilize it, to talk with you about it. So when trouble and persecution come because of the word, not because of evil, not because of ungodliness, because you've chosen to align yourself, you fall away. Then there's a third category, the one who received the seed that fell along the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. Now you hear it, you receive it. It takes root, there is growth. There is the beginning of germination and life, but the worries of life and the deceitfulness of this present system. I can secure my own future. I can take care of myself. I can build big enough barns and accumulate enough. I can have enough connections. I can secure myself. It says it chokes it. The old English word for worry means to choke in the way that a predator would worry at the neck of a sheep to choke the life out of it. Worry is not a casual thing. I don't believe it's an accident that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said multiple times, don't worry. Don't worry. But it's a very tumultuous time. It's a time of turmoil. It's a time of instability. Yes. But don't worry. What's your foundation? What are you trusting? And then there's this fourth category. It's the good soil. The one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the one who hears the word It understands it and produces a crop. Again, Jesus is saying the same thing repetitively. He's using different word pictures. Here he's using a farmer planting a crop. In another instance, he uses a person building a house. But the message is identical. You hear the word and you put it into practice. Now, I believe the general analysis of the season is accurate. We're living in a time of turmoil, of shaking. And I believe it will intensify before it abates. It's it's almost unimaginable what we're watching. But I believe it's not only possible, I believe we've been given the, the tools we need to flourish in a very real way in the midst of the turmoil. If we will choose to focus on what we've been told and to yield to it, in obedience. But we'll have to let that make it all the way to our will. More than an emotional response, more than groupthink, we'll have to be willing to choose the Lord even when there's persecution because we've chosen the Lord. And and the most painful persecution doesn't come from strangers, it comes from people you know. I mean, it's not really too upsetting with me when people in other faraway places say, I disagree with you. you know, I don't it's the people that know your story and say it to you. Right? So don't look at the wind and the waves. Remember what Jesus said to Peter? Why did you doubt, dude? I'm standing here next to you. What are you looking at? What's the counsel of the author of Hebrews? Focus your attention on Jesus. So there's the correlation between your anxiety, your worry, your sense of uncertainty, and what you're focusing your attention on. How many times have I said, you need to be aware of what's happening in the world. You want to watch and listen, but don't just do a deep dive into it. Keep your focus, your attention, your heart set on the Lord, what he's doing. How I can cooperate with him more fully. How I can bring greater alignment to him. 
During COVID, when the virus was unknown and there was a lot of anxiety, we were all pretty focused on how we could limit our exposure. We were washing the cans we brought home from the grocery store. We didn't shake hands with anybody. We waved at people through layers of glass. Right? And repentance is not just for the pagans or the ungodly or the wicked. The best repenters in the house should be the most mature amongst us. We should practice the repentance the same way we practice hygiene. Regularly with careful attention or nobody wants to be near you. And the same is true spiritually. If we don't give careful attention to an attitude and a spirit of repentance and humility, we are stinky spiritually. It's an honor to be with you again. We're working on establishing our foundations, not just being superficial people of faith, but having a foundation that will withstand the turmoil of the world we're living in. We don't have to fear the storms if we'll build the foundation right. And with God's help, we can do that. We're gonna look specifically at baptism in the New Testament. There's more than one. It has more than one application for us and more than one outcome for us. If we're informed, we can be ready for any turmoil that happens to present itself. We'll be triumphant in Jesus. Grab your Bible and a notepad. Most of all, open your heart. I've been working through a series that I want to continue with you. Um, the, 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 the larger picture is how do we thrive in the midst of tribulation? Not the tribulation, but tribulation. The, the, the vernacular, the street language for tribulation is big trouble. And I'm of the opinion that the trouble that was ushered in with the pandemic and that remember way back when, when they said, if you'll shelter in place for two weeks, we could flatten the curve and go back to normal. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I don't think we're finished with that season yet. I honestly think probably the greatest disruptions are still in front of us. Not so much from COVID-19, but from some other things because I don't think we're finished with that shaking yet, and I don't think God is finished with what he's doing in our hearts and our lives. I'm excited by what I see happening, but I, I'm, I'm concerned that we be prepared to stand. And so we looked at a couple of things. We looked at that Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the ultimate foundation. He's the foundation of our faith. He's the foundation of our standing in the kingdom of God. There is nothing else that can go before him. We can't be a hyphenated Christian and imagine ourselves to be Christians. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. And it's through him and through faith in him that we have access to the kingdom of God. We don't earn it. It's not merit-based. It's a gift made available to us. But in receiving the gift, there is a responsibility that comes to us to lay our lives down. You can't be Lord and Jesus be Lord at the same time. So there, there's no such thing as cheap grace. That's deception. So we looked to some extent at that Jesus is the foundation and then we turn to Hebrews chapter 6. And I want to read it again. It's in your notes this time. I think I left it out the last time and caused some consternation. It says, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. I'd like to go on to maturity with the Lord, wouldn't you? I'm not even sure we've cared about that. Most of us, what we wanted to know is, are we saved? And if I'm saved, who cares? Folks, that's a messed up thought. That's as messed up as thinking if I, if I have a baby and the baby's born, I don't really care if they grow, learn. Make sense? So the invitation here is that we can go beyond the elementary things, the childlike things, and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation. And he's going to list six foundational doctrines, elementary doctrines. So you need not only the foundation of Jesus, that personal relationship with the Savior, we need a foundation of doctrine. Doctrine just is, is kind of a fancy word for teaching. You need to understand some things that are foundational to your faith or you can be easily toppled. And the reason I'm taking these, these weeks with this is I have a feeling that in front of us, they're going to be far more bold expressions of the false church than we've ever seen. 
They will, they will have ecclesiastical language and ecclesiastical architecture and the language you'll be familiar with, but they won't be centered on the person of Jesus and the foundational teachings that they will be sharing will not be biblical. And if you're not aware, if you've just been guilty by association, well, I believe what they believe. Or you just plug in the label of the denomination or the congregation where you prefer and you think, well, just because I went there, I didn't have to think about it. No. So I, 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 we're taking some time so that you have the ability to stand as the disruptions increase. Not laying again, now there's six things that'll be listed. The foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God. And we've taken some time with repentance and faith in God. We could come back and explore those a little more, but we at least have started. Instructions about baptisms, that's three. The laying on of hands, four. The resurrection of the dead, five. And eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. That last phrase intrigues me. Well, why would God not permit? Why would God keep, doesn't God want everybody to mature? He does, but I don't believe God will let you build the, the structure beyond the quality of your foundation. I mean, even our civil governments won't let us build a building unless we get the foundations right. There's inspections and permits and all sorts of processes. Do you think that the creator of the universe isn't at least that clever? I mean, it's stated there that, that you need God's permission to go on to maturity and the permission is linked to our willingness to establish the foundation. So I wanna invite you, this, you say, well, that's not a topic that interests me too much. Well, it needs to be a topic that you not only understand, but that you can help one another with. Because we, we mature, we come to fullness as a community of faith, not just as singular individuals. So God permitting, we will do so. Well, I wanna take the time we have in this session and explore the third one in that list, instruction about baptisms. And it's worth noting that they're pl it's plural. So it isn't just instruction about baptism. In fact, the New Testament presents to us different kinds or types of baptism. And I just want to give you really an introduction to them. There are multiple baptisms presented. We're gonna look at three. John's baptism, John the Baptist. Who knew John, you know, Baptist was not his last name. Right? Nor was it a denominational affiliation. You know, John the Methodist and John the Baptist and John the Presbyterian and John the Internot denominational. <laughs> the, the label got attached because John's ministry, his public persona, was directly linked to inviting people to repentance and baptism. So he's known as John the Baptist. Then Christian baptism in water. And then thirdly, bapti the baptism in the Holy Spirit or spirit baptism. It's probably helpful to, to at least acknowledge something that baptize is not really an English word. I mean, I know it's printed in English, but it, it's really a Greek word. And they simply took the Greek letters and wrote the, wrote the word in English letters. The Greek verb is baptizo. And from that, we get the word baptize which to understand its meaning, you need to know the Greek meaning and the simplest or most complete definition in Greek is to immerse. That's what baptize means. Now there's some theories why when they translated the Bible from Greek into English, that they didn't use the meaning of the word, they just pulled the word over because that clearly left the meaning of the word open to interpretation. In Hebrew, the word for water is maim. And if you didn't want, if I didn't want you to know what water was, I wouldn't translate maim into water. I would just write maim in English letters. And it would leave it to who you, whoever was reading it to you to, to put a meaning to it. Does that make sense? So when the English Bible was translated, they didn't give us the meaning of the word. They just pulled a word that we didn't know in. Now, baptism has a function in your imagination, but I assure you when it was first written in English, that wasn't true. Other than from a context, you know, if it said you were drinking mime, you would know it wasn't dust or gravel. You wouldn't know whether it was a Coca-Cola or water, but you would know it was a beverage that could be consumed. Now, there's some theories around that. We don't know. There's not a video playing on YouTube. 
It wasn't recorded in the social media. One of the suggestions was because by that time, the, the, the Church of England was not baptizing by immersion any longer. And to have introduced the meaning of the word baptize could have caused some consternation within the church. I don't know if that's true or not. Doesn't particularly make a difference other than for us to understand that the word as it's used in the scripture means to immerse. Now you can immerse in two ways. You can, one way of translating is to dunk or to plunge, but you can be just as completely immersed. If you stood under Niagara Falls, you would be immersed, right? So it can be from above or it can be something that you're put into, but it, it, either way, it means to be immersed. Now for our presentation in this session, I'm gonna do my best to focus on outcomes or the purpose of the baptisms. I think it'll help us begin to establish some awareness of these multiple baptisms and the different roles they play as they're presented to us in the New Testament. Let's start with John's baptism. That's the order it's introduced to us. <clears throat> in Mark chapter one and verse three, it says, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now that's John's message, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. We read that and we're not particularly familiar with the geography and it's easy to read past a great deal that's happening there that's really quite bizarre. Certainly it would have to be, I would suggest, God initiated the center of religious life for the Jewish people is Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, it's the temple. And the areas surrounding the temple, on the day of Pentecost, when 3,000 people are baptized, they don't go to the Jordan River. They're baptized in the places that are around the Temple Mount that are prepared for just that function. But John isn't doing baptism at the Temple Mount. Three times a year, the Jewish people are commanded to go to Jerusalem as a part of their worship of the Lord. But John is not drawing anybody's attention to the temple in Jerusalem. He's inviting them on a 20 mile walk into the desert, a rather difficult, unpleasant journey. It's not just something you could do casually on the way home from work. And it says that more than one or two people were responding to John. It says they were the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. In fact, there are significant enough crowds moving towards John that it elicits the jealousy of the religious leaders in Jerusalem and they come to see what John is doing. And he says to them, who warns you to escape the coming judgment, you brood of vipers? Aren't those bridge building words? You know, one of the messages that we have heard just ad nauseum in the church for a decade or more is all the language we use should be totally inviting to people that are resisting or opposing God. Now, I'm an advocate for reaching people with the gospel. I think there has to be a, a part of what we do and who we are that helps people that don't understand the story to interpret it. We have to use language that they can understand and present it in a way that they can interpret. I think that's important. But if you've been introduced to the Christian faith and you're living in a godly way, you don't need inviting words. You need to hear a call to repentance. We're walking through a season where our reality isn't easy to establish. We're not sure which messages to trust or which messengers are really trustworthy. Fear has been unleashed as a tool to manipulate enormous blocks of people. And our opponent are not people or institutions or organizations or expressions of government. The, the wrestling match is with spiritual forces of darkness in this world. And if you haven't realized it yet, I assure you there's a battle underway for the heart and soul of America. And again, the question, what should we do? How do we respond? I'm just an individual. Nobody knows my name or pays attention to me. I don't have access to great power or resources. What should we do? I began writing Big Trouble Ahead when we first heard about COVID-19. There was this frightening virus coming our way from Wuhan with predictions that millions of people were going to die. Well, I opened my Bible. I began to say, God, what are you doing? 
And what became so clear to me is that there was big trouble ahead. It's a biblical word. The biblical word is tribulation. And there's multiple warnings that between here and the end of the age, there's going to be some big trouble. We shouldn't be frightened or caught off guard. What I didn't know when I began writing was how quickly it would come or the depths to which we would descend. This week, the World Health Organization said that gender is not binary. They could read their Bible and save them some trouble. God hasn't changed his mind. In our own nation, the violence, the lawlessness, the disregard for boundaries that have been established for generations, the economic uncertainty, it grows week over week. Here's the good news. God has given us a real plan for flourishing in the midst of the trouble. We don't have to be frightened or threatened or intimidated. God's got this, and so do we. As reeling events continue to unfold in our nation and world, the news headlines will have to be deciphered through the lens of a biblical perspective. And Pastor Allen has an urgent message of hope in his new book, Big Trouble Ahead. We can take hold of a real plan to stabilize us through the shaking and even flourish in the midst of it. Big Trouble Ahead lays out the fundamental truths and instructive foresight found within the Bible to help prepare us to overcome as the birth pains continue. And it explains how to counter the barrage of deception that's trying to rob us of our courage and stability. Get Big Trouble Ahead when donating $25 more today at allenjackson.com or by calling 1-800-880-5102. Hey, this is Pastor Alan Jackson. I want to give you a personal invitation to join us here on our campus in Middle Tennessee at World Outreach Church for our fall festival. It starts the weekend of September the 24th and will continue through the first three weekends in October. Saturday night, our church service will be outdoors. You can enjoy the beautiful fall weather in Tennessee. After service, we'll enjoy a worship concert together featuring special guest artists each week. They'll include Matthew West, Meredith Andrews, Carrie Job, Cody Carnes, and Big Daddy Weave. There'll be food trucks. You can bring your favorite camp chair. Sunday mornings, services are back inside. Be a different sermon, but we'll be in the building. Church is located just 30 minutes southeast of Nashville, so fit in some time to see the greater Middle Tennessee area. I look forward to seeing you on campus this fall. You don't want to miss this opportunity to gather with God's people. You can go to alanjackson.com for more details. And please be sure to RSVP so we know you're coming. The purpose of John's baptism was to prepare the hearts of the people for the arrival and the revelation of the long-awaited Messiah. That's the essence of John's ministry. He's such an important character. Such an important character. Jesus said of those born among men, there's nobody greater. Not Isaiah, not Jeremiah, not Moses. Nobody greater. But the one who's least in the kingdom of God, you see, they're still standing in front of the redemptive work of Jesus, counting on the atoning work of the sacrifices. John provides a link between the law and the prophets in the presentation of the gospel. Now, John's message brought with it a couple of requirements, and we should acknowledge them and recognize them because I think they speak to what's happening around us today. One, his message was about repentance, and we've explored that in some detail. It's a change of thought and a corresponding change of behavior. You have to change how you think. And repentance is not just for the pagans or the ungodly or the wicked. The best repenters in the house should be the most mature amongst us. We should practice the repentance the same way we practice hygiene regularly with careful attention or nobody wants to be near you. And the same is true spiritually. If we don't give careful attention to an attitude and a spirit of repentance and humility, we are stinky spiritually. So John comes with a message of repentance, not to the Canaanites, not to the people other than the house of Israel, to the chosen people of God, offering sacrifices, going to the temple, celebrating the right holidays, eating the right food, keeping the rules, reading the Torah. He says to them, you need to repent. Now, why does that matter to us? Because the message of repentance of your sins is what facilitated the arrival of the Messiah. And I believe that same will be true before he comes back again. 
So if we want one thing we can do to facilitate or expedite the return of the Lord is to be willing to cultivate the practice of repentance and acknowledge that we need forgiveness of sins. Amen. The act of baptism was an outward seal of an inward transformation which had already taken place. John wanted you to repent and give evidence of your repentance before you got into the water of baptism. Baptism was this outward seal. Now there's some language around that that we'll use later in another baptism. But repentance and baptism played a very significant part in preparing the hearts of the people for the arrival of the Messiah. It had changed their focus from Jerusalem and the temple to their own, their own personal responsibilities. They were no longer just a part of the group think. Remember what they said to Jesus? We're children of Abraham. Abraham's our father. How dare you say to us? And what did he say? I can make sons of Abraham out of the rocks. You knuckleheads, living Bible. And I believe that same spirit of repentance will be an important part of the unfolding purpose of God in preparing us for Jesus' next arrival. But now the second baptism we see in the New Testament is Christian baptism, and they're different. They're not the same. In Matthew chapter 3, it says Jesus came from Galilee. It's the northern part of Israel. He grew up in Nazareth, which is in the Galilee, to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him or to discourage him. John said, I need to be baptized by you, and yet do you come to me? And Jesus replied, let it be so now, for it's proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And John consented. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my Son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Now, Jesus is baptized by John in the Jordan River in the midst of all these other people that are coming to repent of their sins. So Jesus is standing in the midst of a crowd of people that are publicly perceived and understood to be sinners who are publicly acknowledging their sin and confessing. Sometimes we struggle with that. We want to act like we're not amongst the people who need that stuff. And yet Jesus walks right into the middle of that now, he's in a different place. Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist, but the purpose and the outcome are different from John's ministry of baptism. Jesus hasn't committed any sins for which he needed to repent or to confess. John recognized that. It's why John said, I, I need to be baptized of you. I, I don't have a ministry that you need. I need ministered to by you. Something else is happening here. Look at 1 Peter 2, verse 21. It says, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. Jesus was establishing a pattern for his followers. He's leaving us an example in Peter's language. It's a very significant part of Jesus' life and ministry, showing us how to engage the kingdom of God. If you'll follow the disciples through over and over again, you'll see them demonstrating a behavior in the book of Acts that they watched Jesus show them through the Gospels. I mean, to the point of raising people from the dead. Remember the story when they brought Jesus, the young girl was, he said, she's not dead, she's only asleep. And they laughed at him and he put the mourners out. And, well, Peter's going to use that same practice later on in his life when Jesus is ascended back to heaven. I get it. You know, he's, he's running the scenario through his mind. This is what the Lord did. Let's go. And Jesus is establishing a pattern for his church. John understood Jesus didn't need repentance when he said, I need to be baptized by you. But Jesus responded with the phrase that you should know. He said, it's proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus fulfilled, or if you prefer, completed his inward righteousness by this outward act of obedience to his heavenly father. Do you know God will ask you to do some things? 